Good day, listeners and viewers. My name is Samuel Emende. I'm back again with another lesson on ecology. But this time around, we are going to be looking at community interactions. Before we go into community interaction, I think it's good we go, we go back and look at and revise or recap what we have done in the last lesson on ecology. In the last lesson, we talk about what's ecology. We said ecology is the study of interactions between organisms and their environment. After the, the definition, we look at some of the ecological terms, like population, ecological niche, a habitat. And we also look at population growth, where we talked about uh, the logistic and exponential growth. I would not want to dwell much on that, but we are going to move on to today, today's lesson, which is community interaction. First of all, if I may ask, why do organisms interact? One of the things that, the, uh, one of the reasons why organisms interact is for them to establish an ecological niche and also to shape the environment, to shape the environment in which they are living. And uh, in our community interactions today, there are other headings that we are going to be looking at, and like interaction, energy flow, and ecological succession. I, I repeat again, in ecological community, uh, we are going to look at interaction, energy flow, and ecological succession. First of all, we said, why do organisms interact? They interact in order to establish an ecological niche and also to shape the environment or the ecosystem in which they live. And in ecological interactions, we are going to look at the feed relationship that occurs in an ecosystem or in an e e ecology. One of these feed relationships, we are going to talk about competition. We also talk about predation and symbiosis. Symbiosis is divided into three, which is mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. These are feed relationships that occurs or that takes place in community interaction. Uh, looking at this slide, what can we see? Uh, we are seeing trees, tall ones and short ones. And here, what, are, what is happening in this habitat or this community? The tall trees and the short trees, they are competing. And when you talk about competition, when organisms try to establish resources, or when they try to compete for resources in the same place, and at the same time, competitions always occur. Like most of the time, you say, you look at, like two bulls cannot drink in the same trough or in the same bucket at the same time. Most of the time, they compete. And the, ones that, uh, the one that is stronger will always overpower the one that is weak. So that's what we call, is they are competing. Let's come back to this slide. We are looking at these trees. Some are tall and some are short. What are the things that they are competing with? They're competing for? If you look at it, uh, if you look at the, 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 the slide properly, you realize that they are competing, one of the major resources they are competing is for light. The tall trees, they overpowered the short one. That means the short ones, before they are exposed to the light, uh, the tall trees, the leaves, they are spread evilly. So the short, uh, the short ones do not have access to uh, too much light. You said the ability to compete for resources is dependent upon whether an organism has that adaptation that enable it to, uh, to compute. And when you talk about adaptation, 
we said it's ability of an organism to live in a particular environment and survive, provided that another organism different from it cannot do so in that environment. Uh, I just want to digress a little concerning this adaptation. Sometimes, like for instance, when a scorpion, a national team is playing football, we call some of our foreign base players, like from Europe, okay? Some of those players who have been playing in Europe, we call them to come to, the, to our country and defend the colors of our country. And sometimes the climate that they find themselves, the climate is always hot, hot. It's very, very hostile. Most of these people, they have been playing in, the, in Europe, in Europe for, for many years, and they're adapted to that climate. They're adapted to that cool climate. So sometimes when they don't perform well, we start insulting them in the football pitch. But that's what a, a normal fan always wants to do. He always wants his team to win. But most of the time when he loses, he starts to complain. But let's come back to our lesson. Adaptation, because the organism has the ability to, to survive and to, 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 to do life activities in that environment. Other organisms, different from that, they do not survive. Here we said trees in the forest are, in comp are, in competition, are competing for what? Light. They are competing for light. The tall, broad leaf trees outcompete the small trees for sunlight. So that is competition. So we are moving to predation. We said predation occurs when an organism captures or predates or feeds on another organism, which is called a prey. If you look at these three slides uh, in, on the screen, the, uh, from my left going to the right, we are seeing three uh, different interactions in different organisms. The first one, we see a ladybird beetle eating an elf. You see that it is the, the, the ladybird is preying over the elf. So it is eating on the, on the elf. So the, the ladybird is the predator, and the, the elf is, is the prey. Looking at the other slide, we have a cheetah striking a gazelle. A cheetah is chasing after a gazelle. And if it happens that the cheetah catches up the gazelle, it will eat it. So that means that the gazelle will be the food for the cheetah. And in the, in the other one, we have the marine environment where we have a great white shark capturing a prey, a fish. So these are the different examples of predation. During predation, organisms, they have the ability to hide. Okay, uh, the organisms have to hide from the prey, and the, the prey has the ability to hide from what? From the predator, and they also the, uh, the predator also has the, chance, the techniques how it, what it can catch its what, the prey. So that is, uh, that is what it was, so now predation is a driving factor that can lead to co-evolution. It can lead an organism to run away from that environment because it is trying ways in which it can run away from the predator. And as it's running away from the predator, it is gradually leaving that environment. And also the prey also is also taking some tactical skills, it's trying to employ it to use some of the skills in order to catch up what its prey. This is what we can see in the slide here. So the, we move on to the other feed relationships in an ecosystem. We talk about symbiosis. When you say symbiosis, it means organisms living together. And in a symbiosis relationship, Sometimes some organisms benefit, sometimes they do not benefit, okay? So here, when you say a, a symbiosis relationship, it, it could be two organisms living together. You say when two species live closely together, they are said to be in a form of a symbiosis relationship. Looking at the slides here, 
we have three different uh, relationships. We have mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. These are the feeding relationships that we are going to be talking in our subsequent slides. If you look at this one, the mutualism, what can we see on the slide? We, see, we, we can see a flower and a bird, or we can say, even say, an in, even you can even use an insect there. And what is the bird doing there? The bird, it is feeding on the nectar of the flower. And as it is feeding, it is also doing the same thing by what? Transport, uh, transporting pollen grains. Okay, transferring pollen grains. So, and when it transfers pollen grains, it's able to, uh, to, to fertilize the flower. It says, in mutualism, both species benefit from the relationships. And examples of a mutualistic relationship, we said a hummingbird, an insect, and a flower. A, a, a hummingbird slash insect or a flower. The flower provides the hummingbird insect with nectar, and the hummingbird helps the flower produce by transporting the pollen from one flower to the other. So now in a, in a mutualistic relationship, it's a win-win situation. It's, this, one is not a, this one is not dependent on this one. They are all winning. It's, they are all benefiting. But in other relationships, some organisms benefit, whereas others do not benefit. But in a mutualistic relationship, it's a win-win situation. I win, you win. So you benefit, I benefit. So that is it's a fair deal. So another example of a, a mutualistic relationship we talk about, a leech is made up of two organisms, namely green alga and fungus. So now, uh, one thing that we can see here, the green alga benefit from the fungus by what is, it, 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 it encloses it and protects the alga. And also it protects it from what? Physical injury and during what? Dryness. When the place is dry, the, the fungus protects the, the alga. And also the alga also provide water for the fungus. But the fungus benefit by some of the food manufactured by the algae. That's what the fungus does. It benefits from the food that is manufactured. Another example of a mutualistic relationship, we said nitrogen-fixing bacteria in root nodules of leguminous plants. If you look at what are leguminous plants, first of all, we say these are plants that are as of what? Nutrients, nitrogen to the soil. And what are some of those examples of uh, those leguminous plants? We talk about beans, groundnut. These are examples of leguminous plants. They have a bacteria, uh, the bacterium that is found in this leguminous plant is called the rhizobium leguminosarium. This bacteria helps to add nutrients to the, to the soil. So the bacteria obtain nutrients from the cells of these plants, grow there, and these this, uh, this nutrients multiply, and they reproduce. The rhizobium bacteria is fixed nitrogen directly into the soil, thus increasing the nitrogen requirement of the leguminous plants. Another example also of uh, mutualistic relationship or mutualism Bacteria in the roots, bacteria in the rumen of ruminants. I think it's good we understand this. You said bacteria in the rumen of ruminants. A rumen is a, a stomach compartment in ruminated animals. We say ruminated animals are animals that chew the cord. Examples of some of these animals are goat, sheep, cows. 
they have the ability to choose their code. You see, this bacteria digest cellulose to sugar. They help to digest some of this cellulose to sugar. And, and some of these things is being changed to what you call amino acids and vitamins from the food substances. The ruminant make, and, and some of these cellulose, like the plant part that they eat, okay, those are what we call the cellulose. The ruminant make use of the sugar, amino acid, and vitamin obtained from the activities of the bacteria. So what does the ruminant do, the animal, what does it do for some of these, for this, for these organisms or these bacteria? The rumen provide protection, shelter, and food for the bacteria. That's, the, or that's what the animal does, or the rumen. So another example of mutualism is, is a protozoa in the intestine of thymus. When you talk about these protozoans, uh, you know thymus they eat on uh, plant materials, on wood materials or paper. And then uh, these protozoans, they are found in the intestines of what of these thymus. They help to, to digest cellulose, and in turn, okay, it, it, the thymus benefit because the protozoa helps to digest the cellulose in the food of the termites. Whereas also, the protozoa also benefit the intestine of the termite by providing protection for it. So now the protozoa, it provides protection for the termites. Okay? The protozoa benefit because the intestine of the termite provide protection for it. So here, Another uh, feed relationship is the, the commensalist feed relationship. And in the commensalist feed relationship, we talk about uh, this type of relationship is a win and a natural situation, whereby somebody wins and somebody does not win. When you we talk about the, mutual, the mutual, uh, mutualistic relationship, that type of relationship we talk about is a win-win situation, whereby all organisms win. But in the commensalist relationship, there is a difference. We say in commensalism, one species benefits from the relationship, while the other is neither loses nor gain. You neither lose, you no gain. You are just there to, 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 to house the other organism or to provide a protection or way of life for the other organism. Here, we are seeing a room of fish and a shark. A shark is a big animal or mammal, and the room of fish is just attaches itself to the, to the shark. The room of fish feeds on the food that's been left by the shark on the part of the shark's body, and the room of fish is being transported and at the same time protected by the shark. And what does the room of fish do for the shark? Sometimes it cleans up for the shark. Okay, so the room of fish is protected by the shark and transported quickly from one part of the ecosystem to another. Pieces of the food from the shark prey are dependent on by the room of fish. So what the room of fish does is to depend anything that is left over by the shark, it is, it is utilized by what the Roma fish. So that's what it does. It, it benefits by that. And the Roma fish, uh, the Roma fish is, is attached to the shark. So the shark provides protection and then transport it to different places of the, in the ecosystem. Another example of this type of commensalist relationship is an oyster and a crab. It's an oyster and a crab. The habitation of a crab is in the oyster cell. So now the oyster cells come and what stays in the, habit, in, in, the, in, the, in, the oyster, in the crab. We say the habitation of the crab is in the oyster cell. The crab is protected by the oyster, and the oyster is neither harm nor does it benefit. The oyster is neither harm nor does it benefit. 
Another example of a, a commensalist relationship, feeding relationship, is talk about man and intestinal bacteria. Let's look at it. We have to be differentiate intestinal bacteria and intestinal tapeworms. They are different because we are going to look at the intestinal tapeworms later. We said man and intestinal bacteria. We said some bacteria live in large intestine of man. These bacteria feed on digested food of man. The bacteria get some shelter and protection. You realize that some of these bacteria, they get some shelter and protection from this intestine. The man is neither, neither benefit nor is he or she harmed by the relationship. So those bacteria, as food goes inside the bacteria, uh, inside the, uh, the intestine of man, the bacteria acts on the food and breaks the food for, for it to be utilized by man. So that's another example of what you call a commensalist relation, food relationship. And then we move on to the, the last for this one is a uh, feed relationship is parasitism. In a parasitism relationship, it's a win and lose situation. One person benefits and the other one does not benefit. Okay? And like for instance, if two students are in a class or they are in a, the same school, and they are going to the school. Sometimes, if they are if they are given lunch to go and spend, uh, if they are given money to go and spend during break, one of the students may decide to keep his money, and he will be what, waiting on the other person, the other student. As soon as he or she buys the bread from the vendors in the market, he'll always come and say, "Give me some, give me some." At a certain stage, the person is what is a parasite. He's entirely depending on the other person. We say in parasitism. One organism benefits while the other organism is harmed. You, you, you harm the other because all the food nutrients is being taken by, which is supposed to be utilized by the, that organism. The, other organ, the, the parasite is taking all those organisms. We say paras, parasites are organisms that obtain all or most of their nutrients from their host. The host parasites relationships benefits the parasites at cost of what the host at the cost of the host the parasites will have benefit like here we are looking at a mosquito feeds on uh, a mosquito feed off on the blood of organisms mosquitoes carry various types of parasites and viruses that cause diseases like yellow fever and malaria so now we are seeing that the the, 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 the mosquito survives on the blood of what, the human being. And some of these organisms that also, dip, that also want parasitism like teeth and cow. Some of these teeth, they depend on the cow to suck their blood and some of these other organisms. And then we have what you call man and tapeworm. You see, the human beings, they provide food for the tapeworm. They also provide protection and shelter for the tapeworm. Whereas, the tapeworm, what it does, it makes the human being suffer. And sometimes people, you see some people, they eat a lot. And at the end, you see them, they just look like number one. They, they are just lean, they are just small. Most of, sometimes, most of the, the food that they eat is being absorbed or is being taken by some of these worms in their system. That's why it is very, very important. After every three to six months, you do what you call deworming. So that if, in case, worms are in your system, they can be easily flushed out. So, and we also have another plant here, and a mistol and a, a, a flowering plant. Say so this mistol is only partly dependent on its host for food. It partly dependent on its host for food. Hence, it is said to be a partially plant parasite because it is partially a plant parasite. It depends on its host for food, and even if roots, it extends down to the host. For, for food. And uh, this are uh, another example of plants. Uh, uh, this one we said is a Cassian filiforms. It's a thin thread like stem, which normally calls around the stem of the host. 
Sometimes if you go around the bush, you see some of these plants, they coil around the host. And what, does they do, and what do they do? They depend entirely on the host for their food. They extend their, their, their root. It says, uh, curves around the stems of the root of the host. At interval, send suckers. Because some of these, uh, some of these plants, they send some of their suckers, like the tapeworm, you know, it, 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 his head is full of some suckers. So now it sends of his suckers down to the host, and it, will, it take up the nutrients entirely from the host. So you said it has no roots and no chlorophyll. Because some, this plant, it has no roots and it has no chlorophyll. It will not be able to, to make its own food. If at all there were some chlorophylls and some roots for, each, for it to anchor on, it might be able to make their own food, but it cannot make their own food. Here, the next slide, we are seeing what you call energy flow. And the primary source of light or energy, the primary source of energy is the sun. It's a living organisms rely on constant source of what energy. The primary source of energy is the sun. If you look at this slide, the sun is reflecting, uh, is reflecting light to the earth. And when this light is being reflected to the earth, about 1% of this energy is being utilized by the earth. The other part of the energy is reflected back. That's what we can see in this diagram. So you say energy flow, energy, sorry, sister, you said how many minutes? Five. Huh? But I have a lot to go. <laughs> huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, I'll continue. You say energy flow. Energy from the sun is transported for, uh, from radiant energy to chemical energy by the process of photosynthesis and from chemical energy to thermal energy, heat by cellular respiration. If you are looking at this slide, what we can see here is the cow is feeding on the, on the ground. And some of what is what is feeding is feeding some grass is eating some grasses, and then the animal breaks down the sugar molecules, the sugar molecules that is found in the in, in the on the ground is being absorbed by the by the by the animal. So now when the, when the animal eats of these plants, the the food is now moved, is released. The animal also releases what you call carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide goes to the to the atmosphere, and that carbon dioxide is being utilized by the plant, and the plants will also use it in, during the process of what you call photosynthesis. And in photosynthesis, the plants break uh, down, uses uh, carbon dioxide and water to release uh, oxygen, and the oxygen is now being is being taken by the plants again for it to. So what we can see is in a form of a circle. Oxygen is released. Uh, is carbon dioxide is released by the by the cow, is used by the plant. The, the carbon dioxide is used by the plant, and the same th and the same time again, the plant also releases what, uh, uh, oxygen for the animal to be utilized. So this is what you're talking about is energy flow. Energy is being transferred in the form of what a circle. Energy from the sun is transported or transformed from radiant energy to chemical energy by a process of photosynthesis, and from chemical energy. To thermal energy, heat by cellular respiration. So this equation that we are seeing is energy flow. So like during the process of what, uh, photosynthesis, carbon dioxide, do, these are the raw materials of photosynthesis, carbon dioxide and water. In the presence of light, it will give us a glucose and, and oxygen, which is the byproduct of photosynthesis. And also we talk about cellular respiration. The cellular respiration, this one takes place in the cells of an, of an organism. You say the use, like during respiration, that's what you call cellular respiration. So now, what they use is what glucose, that is sugar, is broken down to release energy. And that energy is in the form of ATP molecules. And then we move on to what you call the autotrophs. We say autotrophs, these are organisms or plants that, that make their own food. So that's why we say auto means self, and uh, trough means nourish. They are able to, uh, to self-nourish themselves. Okay, they are able to, to nourish themselves. This is what you call. 
and here from the diagram we can see light coming from what from the sun and they strike the leaf and then here the arrow one is going up and the other one is going down the one that is going up that means that carbon dioxide is being utilized by the, the, the leaf of the plant and oxygen is being released out it's not needed there and you also have what you call uh, photos for photosynthetic bacteria some of these bacteria they contain chlorophyll and we have what you call the chemical autotrophs they obtain energy from inorganic chemicals and do not contain chloroplast and then you said heterotrophs heterotrophs are organisms they depend entirely on other organisms for their food like what we are seeing in these two slides we are seeing a lion is eating up a dead animal and this other animal is also feeding here. They are, they are entirely depending on other organisms for their food. We say organisms that rely on other organisms for food and energy are called heterotrophs. So here uh, we have seen the different forms of what heterotrophs organisms. We say there are several types of heterotrophs. Herbivorous. You say this are, uh, like a cow is a herbivore. It entirely it depends on plant entirely for their food. And omnivorous. Okay, we see this one eats plants and, and animals. A carnivore, it eats purely animals. A detritus. This organism feeds on plants and dead animals or other parts of what animals. And then decomposes. They break down organic matter. Anything that dies, it is broken down. So now we move on to what you call a food chain. We say, when you talk about a food chain, we are talking about a, a, a feeding relationships. Okay? We say a food chain, the sequential flow of energy from one trophic level to another, from a primary producer to a tertiary consumer, through eating and being eaten. So these are examples of a food chain. So like for instance, we have what you call the, the, the sun. The, the sun is the primary source of what life, okay, of energy. And then in this, the sun, you have what you call grasses. So these grasses are the producers. And then it moved towards to grasshoppers. And then from grasshoppers to snakes. And then snake, we have a hawk. A hawk which you call a tertiary consumer. And then from there, you can, when this hawk also dies, it decomposes. And some, it decomposes by the, some of these fungus and it goes back to, that, to the grass. So this is what you're talking about, a food chain. Okay? From a food chain, we have what we call a food web. We said a food web is a complex feeding relationship in which some organisms may be part of more than one food chain or a network of organisms in an ecosystem which directly or indirectly depend on each other for food. So this is what you're talking about. It's a feeding relationship which organisms, they depend directly or indirectly. And this feeding relationship is a complex one. That means you are bringing more than two organisms together or three organisms benefiting from one organism at the same time. So these are examples of a food web. It's a complex feeding relationship that occurs okay at a different so now it's, uh, here we are just looking at a, a feed relationship to to sum up what we have discussed we said the ultimate source of energy for most living organisms is the sun green plants are able to trap energy from the sun and use it to convert carbon dioxide and water into food okay into food in the form of what sugar in a process known as photosynthesis. Plants are said to make their own food and are called producers. Animals all depend either directly or indirectly on green plants for their food and are therefore known as consumers. And then we have herbivores which feed directly on plants and are known as primary consumers. Carnivores which feed on other animals are known as secondary consumers. A simple food chain shows how energy is transferred from the sun to living organisms. The carnivorous at the end of the food chain is known as a top carnivore or a tertiary consumer. Most animals eat more than one 
kind of food. And so in an ecosystem, food chain connect to form of what a food web. So these are, uh, so now we move on to call pyramid of numbers. We say it's a diagramic, uh, it's a, a diagramic uh, presentation or representation of a number of organisms at different trophic levels in, an, in a food chain. In a natural community, the number of producers outnumbers the consumers. The number of individuals in a various trophic level decreases as you move first to the fourth trophic level. Like you, you can see in, the, in this number, uh, pyramid of numbers, from the, the base, from the down, the organisms are more. As it is going, the grasshopper it is reducing, the lizard is also reducing, and the hawk will eventually is a two. And then also have what you call a pyramid of biomass. We say a total number of what living organisms within a given trophic level is called a biomass. So has, like what you look at the pyramid of numbers and the pyramid of biomass, the, the, the level they are reducing. As the organisms are going, as one trophic level to another, the organisms are, what are all reducing. So this is an example of a, a food pyramid. And the uh, pyramid of uh, energy, before I, make, uh, before I make a leaf of you, I will leave you with this assignment. So this assignment, uh, there are some questions that we need to answer when the next one says, when there are no enough resources for all the organisms in a community, what is the result? Question number one. Question number two, tapeworms live in the intestines of mammals and steal nutrients from them. This is an example of what type of community interaction lead to co-evolution. Number four, relationship in which one organism is helped and the another organism is neither helped nor hurt is called E. coli live in the human colony where they absorb nutrients and produce vitamin K and sodium that sodium that benefit the host this is an example of the, 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 the remaining questions are radiant energy from the sun can be directly be used as an energy source by all organisms number seven all autotrophs obtain energy from the sun via photosynthesis. Number eight, a food chain shows one pathway of energy in a community, while a food web shows all pathways of energy in a community. This one you have to write whether it is true or false. For question six, seven, and eight, you have to write whether the question is true or whether the question is false. Question number nine, explain what happens during energy flow in a food chain. These are the questions that I'm leaving with you uh, for your assignment. So please, I hope you do it. The next, the next class, we are going to start with the assignment, uh, and then we'll go to the next lesson. I was your presenter and a teacher, Mr. Samuel A. Mende. Thank you, and have a good day.